Today we have the inimitable Josh and Seth. Just guess who they might be first. <laughs> Josh and Seth. Let's, let's go one step further. Josh and Seth Myers. I have to say uh, Josh and Seth Myers were probably the most wholesome guests we've ever had. Like one of the most wholesome conversations. Just loved each other so much I instantly wanted to... Yes. Get pregnant with twin boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I told Penn and Nava that I they made me want to have two boys, two brothers. So Their sweet. dynamic was so sweet. Yeah, I had family envy. So Seth Myers, uh, you 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 probably know that name. I mean, there's Late Night with Seth Myers, right? And uh, formerly of Weekend Update on SNL. So that's and head writer pretty, of SNL. That's right. That's right. That's right. And head writer. So I mean, you know, doesn't really get bigger. Um, his brother Josh is a comedic force in his own right. You might know him from Mad TV. Uh, they have a podcast together called Family Trips that we actually, all three of us as a um, fake family, went on <laughs> together. <laughs> and uh, we just spent like a three-hour Myers conversation marathon, and it was so lovely because they they're... They're they're good people, yeah. and they and yeah. they seem to be brought up by good people, and it's just that's really refreshing. Yeah. The one question I wanted to ask them was, do the other comedians ever give you a hard time about how sweet your family is? <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah, I can imagine there's got to be a running joke, uh, but you guys are gonna love it. It was very fun, uh, very sweet. But there's still some, you know, there's some swear words in there too. Yeah. For those of you who need that, <laughs> stick around. <laughs> Welcome to Pod Crushed. We're your hosts. I'm Penn. I'm Nava. And I'm Sophie. And I think we could have been your middle school besties. Falling in love with your older brother. <laughs> what? <laughs> so you guys are you guys are brothers and you're close in age. So I mean, what I understand, you would have been both going through this time of not just middle school, but like coming of age or like together, more or less. Yeah. When he, now, how do you guys, where do you put coming to age? Do you guys have, have you figured out a... You know, we focus on middle school. So that's like what you would have been, 6th, 7th, 8th grade, that you would have been something like, what is that? Are we talking 11 to 14-ish? Yeah. You yeah. just saying those ages brought up one of the most, a memory that still makes my skin crawl. If Tell I may us, share. please. <laughs> so I fancied myself someone who was good at sports and yet at mm. every level I was <laughs> told that was not the case. <laughs> I loved watching sports and I was one of those kids who thought, oh, if I watch enough baseball, I'll be good at baseball. So played a little Little League and then I think it must have been, you tried out every year and then based on the tryouts, they would just even out the skills on the teams in the town league. They basically said, we don't think you're ready for where the seventh graders play. We think you should do another year with the fifth and sixth graders. Is that why we got to play together? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you were held back. I was basically wow. held back from baseball. And I remember getting the call and just, first of all, just cold sweat. Because it was the coach telling me, hey, good news. We're going to have you. We think another year. And first of all, you realize if you're, um, you know, 13 and they're holding you back in baseball, that's basically, they're killing your major league dreams in that moment, too. <laughs> There's never a story about, you know. You know, Albert Pujols was <laughs> had to do sixth grade twice in baseball. So, but then I remember uh, trying to decide if it was, if I was too embarrassed and was, if I was going to quit. And I decided I wouldn't quit. And I was going to do uh, another year of baseball because I liked playing baseball. But here's the part that I'm really embarrassed. I was in the dugout and I didn't like tell all the kids on the team, like, I'm here because I, you know, it wasn't good enough to go up early. And someone was like, wait, you're in whatever grade. You're in seventh grade. What are you doing here? When's your birthday? And somebody said, when's your birthday? And instead of telling them, I tried to lie. <laughs> To get the ages to work, that why I was like, doing quick which math is very, in your head. yeah, very <laughs> quick math to figure out what what yes. the right date to say would be. Yeah, and I in exact and and uh, nor was I quick enough to execute this. So I basically fumbled on my, and this was in a dugout full of kids. I was like, uh, Mar and they were like, you don't know your birthday? What's wrong with you? So now not only am I bad at baseball. 
I'm like the dumb kid who doesn't know his own birthday. <laughs> it was the worst. And then I remember the the kid who asked later. I thought this would I like a day later. I said, Hey, I want to explain what happened. I'm embarrassed that I'm Aww. playing baseball at this level, and that's why I tried to say a different birthday. And I was and he was looking at me like, What? Like he had completely forgotten. <laughs> like I've been carrying yeah. it around for 24 yeah. hours. Yeah. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to own up to it and they can do with it what they will. And it was just a good reminder that you think everyone's looking at you. And no one is. No one is. Seth, I feel like that's so mature, though. Totally. And like says a lot about you that you like took accountability. You wanted to get it. Out. Yeah. I would have I would have gone to the grave swearing that I was wearing merch yeah. or whatever. <laughs> Mur- 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 I have two birthdays. I don't know what to tell you. Some yeah. people have two birthdays. Yeah. <laughs> that's like when you tried to call uh, later on in life. Seth had a car breakdown and called for a tow truck, but didn't have AAA. But our dad had AAA. Mm. And he told the tow truck driver who looked at the card, the tow truck driver said, what's your name? (laughs) And Seth said, Larry. And the tow truck driver said, but your license says Seth. And he's like, well, Larry's my nickname. (laughs) And the driver said... It, is it, it's like it's also my dad's name and the tow truck driver was like your nickname is your dad's name uh, just deeper, like, just, and deeper just trying to get a deal on a tow I think the big thing here is one of the reasons I've learned to take accountability Nava is I'm a terrible liar mm. and so I, I mostly I have to constantly own up to it because I wouldn't get away with it if I tried to but we couldn't lie growing up that was the Cardinal that was a thing with our parents mm. yeah. in our house. We even once we got to an age where, you know, we might be drinking. Let's say uh, the rule was just admit that you're drinking, and if you're going to someone's house, stay there. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you lied about whether or not you were drinking, that's where you could get in some real trouble. Did you lie? Did you get in trouble? No. I. Th- yeah, I mean, well, there was the one time that uh, I lied. We were going to, where was I? Maybe like Molly Suter's house or Amy Way's house. And my, But my friends, I, I sort of hung out in high school a lot with a Randy, a Tim, and a Tim. And we spent so many nights sleeping at Randy Suazo's house. Mm-hmm. And there was a night where everyone sort of lied and said they were staying at another guy's house because we were going over to this girl's house and she was having a party and we were going to be drinking. And in the morning, uh, Tim O'Brien called my house because, uh, or Tim O'Brien's parents called my house because uh, they had been told that they were all sleeping over at our place. And he had to go home to help his father move a dining room table. And my father said, no, they're not here. And then there was this chain of calls Mm. going on to figure out where the boys have been. And Seth woke up earlier than he would ever wake up on a Sunday morning because he heard all of this activity, (laughs) came downstairs, sat at the kitchen table. (laughs) I came in and came home and my dad said, where were you? And I said, I was at Randy's. And he said, nope. And I was like, I, oh, right, I was at, I was at Tim O'Brien. And he was like, nope. And I was like, Tim Wilson's? He said, nope. And I was like, all right. You, you I was, kept trying. I kept yeah. trying. I went through the, the, all the houses, and I was like, all right, I was at Molly Suter's. And he's like, okay, you're grounded. And Seth just stood up and went right back to bed. And he was so happy. But he had, I knew. He had witnessed I knew it. he would try to lie his way out of it. I knew they had him dead to rights. It was, uh, it was, it was like watching the thrill you get when you watch that last courtroom scene in A Few Good Men. I knew exactly. <laughs> yeah. I wish I had it on tape so I could watch it over and over again. Yeah, I'm sure I was so very good. bad in the moment. Um, there was, uh, I did take the don't lie to your parents thing seriously. And I remember once I did one of those things where went to a friend's lake house you know, uh, late high school, we all drank a lot, and there was a long dock. And, like, late at night, I ran down the dock and dove off. And as I dove off, I heard someone go, it's shallow! And, Ooh. like, hit my face against, like, the rocks um, <gasps> on the ground. And so I, my whole face was, like, cut up. Oh, no. And it looked bad. And so the next morning, I had to go back home. And I remember I had a very... Uh, the kind of friend who thought you could get away with anything. And he was like, because I'm like, I'm just going to tell him what happened. He's like, you can't tell him what happened. Here's what's going to happen. And he had a Jeep, like one of those open door Jeeps. He goes, when we pull into your driveway, 
I'll slam on the brakes, fall out, and it'll look like you scraped your face. It'll look like you scraped your face on the because um, we had a gravel driveway. And I was like, I don't want to do that. And it's just everybody, all these guys, because we drove it was like a two-hour drive from you. Know, we lived in, in in southern New Hampshire, and the lakes were you know farther north. So it was like two hours of everybody having. Here's what you should tell them. And I just remember walking in, and my dad's like, "What happened?" I'm like. I dove in for a dock and I hit my face. <laughs> I just couldn't. It was it was just easier yeah, to be yeah. honest with my dad about how dumb his son was than try to prove how dumb he was by yeah. trying to lie his way out of it. <laughs> that's that's great. If you can create yeah. an environment where your kids feel comfortable to tell you the truth, you're yeah, kind of no matter well what. Set. Yeah, I I fully agree. When we were very young. Um, and if we would sort of like leave toys all around or we'd make a mess and someone would come in and uh, be like, who did this? We had a fictional <laughs> duo that we would blame, but I think it was adorable. And they were the bad boys. And you're welcome to join me if you want. But we would always sing. The bad boys did it. The bad boys did it. But we but will, will clean, clean it, it up. up. Oh <laughs> Really, so it's hard cute. to sing on Zoom together. Yeah. You did well. Um, but it's David the bad boys it did it. The bad boys did it, and we will clean it up. And it's like everyone's like, all right. But yeah. it's nice Aww. to have someone to blame in sort of a weird child brain of like, yeah, but we did it, but it's okay, yeah. right? Um, well, I was gonna ask. So it sounds like Seth, there was at least one time where you you woke up particularly to delight in. In yeah. Josh's <laughs> demise. But then what was your relationship like to each other in terms of fighting? Did you fight a lot as siblings? We didn't. I My memory is no. We shared. So we each had our own bedroom, but each of our bedrooms had two beds. It was a bunk bed in Josh's room and two twins in mine. And we always slept together. Aww. So we would choose each night which bed to sleep in. So we had our own room, which we could have our own stuff in. You know, we had our Or own. if you had sleepovers, you would have right. a friend right. sleep in your room. Mm. So we always hung out together. We would only... The only fights were when we roughhoused and someone got hurt, which 100% of the time was Josh. <laughs> yeah. And that... And in, even then, the fight was me not wanting him to go tell mom and dad. Mm. You know, that right. gotten, we, we played in the basement with sort of our playroom... Um, it was a finished basement and there was a, a wood stove and like, that's where we would always hang out. And if I would get hurt, I would instantly start running sort of down this <laughs> snaking hallway to go up the stairs and Seth would try to tackle me and hold me yeah. back. Hurt, hurt you more. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was like, I think that's right. They always say like, it's not the crime, it's the cover up. That yeah. was very much the case with, uh, <laughs> with this. There was one time, I, I have no idea what we were fighting about, but it was, we were so angry at each other and we decided we're going to have an actual like fight. Yeah. Um, and we had an old uh, a couch that would convert into a bed, but it was all foam. It sort of like folded into itself. Yeah, and there so, wasn't metal or anything. Yeah, no metal. So we put that out and that was going to be like the ring <laughs> that we were going to fight in. Yeah. Seth had a friend over and it was like, we're going to ring the bell. And so we came together and we started grappling and I got my hand around Seth's foot and it sort of slipped off the end of his foot. And as it did, his big toenail came off in my <gasps> hand yeah. and it, the fight was over before it started. <laughs> Not, like we were just both so aghast at what had <laughs> happened. I felt terrible. Um, but that was that. I yeah. should note, I also think that fight was very much due to my friend Greg <laughs> who is an agent of chaos. I think his solution was always, oh, we should actually have an organized fight. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I don't, because I don't think Josh and I, our first instinct was ever to fight. Also, Josh was, very, whenever I had friends over, Josh was uh, added in. And our house was mm. the one, we hosted a lot of sleepovers. It was a house people came over to after school. My parents were, I think, of the mind as well. Like, if you're kids like you enough to have their friends over, then you will never have to wonder where they are. Like, mm -hmm. it's better right. to have them in your basement than, you know, yeah, and totally. also just having to, like, go pick them up at somebody else's basement. <laughs> so we were always over, and Josh was always sort of, like, the plus one to our group. 
and uh, less the other way. Like, I don't think the older brother maybe hangs out with the younger uh, brother's friends. But Josh was always sort of part of my group of friends as well. So when you went through this stage, let's say, you know, you're exiting childhood, entering adulthood, it's a long phase, but like, you know, something that starts to happen is just feelings, thoughts, idea, everything just deepens and becomes far more expansive and life, mature life is kind of beginning. Did you, do you, do you recall any like noticeable shift between you two then or like, or like, I mean, maybe the bond just got deeper I and mean, it sounds like you've just had this kind of steady progression, but did you mm -hmm. notice any shift when you're going through this time? No, I also, we never like talked about girls. No, it's I, still, I, you know. Talking about girls still makes me uncomfortable, like with, <laughs> like I've never liked sort of kiss and tell stories that guys might have. Uh, mm. I've never enjoyed those conversations. I don't like talking about them. It always has felt like that's private. I've been, I've been married 10 years. Josh has still never met my wife. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, that's your thing. <laughs> I don't, it's, it's gross. I'm like, where do you think these kids come from? He's like, Ugh. I don't want to think about it. Just yeah, I don't want to think um, about it. Yeah, but yeah, no, we, we never really So we never, yeah, we were never girls. like, ooh, she's hot or there, you know, so we had, I mean, I, you know, and obviously we, we had girlfriends, but that was very much not in the house, which is so funny. Also because our parents are very open and not like about, uh, sex, but about like sexuality, maybe. Mm. I mean, we watched uh, you know movies at, at very age inappropriate times, and the humor in the house was uh, very adult. And yet, despite that, I feel like Josh and I were very prudish when it came to talking about girls with one another. Did you talk to your parents about your feelings towards girls? No, I only remember the my dad's birds and the bees talk with me, and I don't. Oh, I wonder if it was the same one I got. Go ahead. He yeah. said. <laughs> Uh, if you have sex with a girl, it will mean so much more to her than it will mean to you. <laughs> so he said, so don't do it unless you really care about them. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, it was similar. It was, yeah, to me it was like, uh, you know, I was dating this girl and he's like, she, is she clingy? And I was like, I don't know. I don't think of her as clingy. And he's like, there's nothing more clingy in the world than a teenage girl you've just had sex with. And I was like, oh. And he's like, so, so make sure you like her. Uh, and then, yeah, I didn't have sex till college. Larry. Larry. Do you think yeah. that really contributed to it? I don't know. I think I wasn't it necessarily. It did for me. He definitely scared me off it because that. He he put a, but not in a bad way. He but he put he said like, look, there's a real emotional burden. Yeah, sure. To it, and there is, and there is. That's I yeah, and there is, and, it, and he's like, I don't think you're ready for it. Also, I wasn't um, certainly in high school. Like I had girlfriends, but I, ne I never had a girlfriend that I was capable of being heartbroken about. I don't. Hmm. I didn't. It took me a long. I don't know if I ever did. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of alone. I was always like, yeah, or or just go home alone. <laughs> or I'll look, go flip through my baseball cards and read my like comics. Baseball cards, comic books. They're not going to read themselves. Do you feel like getting into those relationships was more just like, oh, this is the thing to do? Because it sounds like yes. you were super interested yeah. in them. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that I didn't. They were always uh, girls that I liked and girls that I was friends with. Yeah. It was just that. I remember a girl I was dating, like back when you were dating where it barely meant anything. Mm-hmm. Like, there was barely a physical element. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Maybe. Like, it was like you could date someone and maybe not kiss them. Mm -hmm. Like, that was <laughs> oh, what yeah, we were first two, That's my first two girlfriends. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. she gave me a cassette single. Um, a cassingle. A cassingle. <laughs> that, for those, uh, for the children listening, that is a cassette tape with only one song on each side. Um, and it was the uh, NXS song, Never Tear Us Apart. And mm -hmm. she gave it to me. And I just remember thinking, oh, I feel like we're in different places. <laughs> 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 what we think about this relationship and that. Can you only imagine if we had sex? <laughs> yeah, my God. Never tear us apart at hand holding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, anything could tear us apart. Another kid coming down the, the hallway. <laughs> uh, so that, yeah, I, I was always very acutely aware that I was not. When guys would be all torn up about a breakup, mm -hmm. that did not. It was not really where I ever felt like I was at. 
Well, this is a good point to ask one of our classic questions, which is to share about your first love and heartbreak. Seth, if you've never been heartbroken the first time you crushed no, a girl. No, I, I, by the way, I, I'm realizing <laughs> that a bunch of college friends are listening right now being like, fucking what? No, but college is different. College is different. College yeah. is different. So I would yeah. say heartbreak was, um, was college. Mm-hmm. I don't think I was, uh, I don't think I was, I was capable of heartbreak in high school. Hmm. How about you, Josh? Josh got Josh has been heartbroken so often. Oh, yeah. I, Josh like, has been so. I hope we get into how dramatic Josh was in let's his hear it. late let's teens, hear it. early twenties. Let's 20s. get into it. We want to hear it. Um, yeah, I mean, my first, like the two girls that I never kissed that I dated. One of them, you know, I. It was just you. You asked a girl, "Will you go out with me?" That was sort of that was the line that you said and then she would say yes or no or you could write it in a note and she could circle yes or no or something like that and I want to say it was maybe in sixth grade and I remember being on a ski lift with a girl and was like working up the nerve to to ask her to go out with me and right before we got off like you know the put your tips up, you're getting to the top of this thing. And I said, will you go out with me? And she said, yes. And then I skied away from her (laughs) and like didn't talk to her, I want to say for two weeks. And then she was like, hey, we need to break up. And I was like, oh, I was crushed. But um, (laughs) you're like, is it something I did? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And that, you know, that would happen again. I had had a a good, you know, girlfriend in, in high school that I don't remember the breakup so much, but the first girl I dated in college uh, was a very short relationship, and I think this is the one Seth's, uh, Seth's talking about. But um, we, you know, I still I was still a virgin. Um, I had just gotten to college. I met this girl, uh, was completely smitten, and um, there were things at our school called. Uh, I don't know if it was a mixer or a date party, but like where a big group of two fraternities and two sororities would go to a bar in Chicago or something like that. And I heard that the girl that I was dating had made out with this guy. Mm. And Mm. I got this piece of gossip and I stomped over to the guy who I really liked and still like, uh, but I walked over to his... um, dorm room and I was like hey did this happen did you make out with her and he's like yeah why and I was like because she's my girlfriend he's like oh sorry I I didn't know and it was you know after a night when people had been out in Chicago so it was late and Seth and I shared a car in college we had a VW Golf and he lived off campus and I went and I got the car and I drove to the last place I could remember being happy, which was <laughs> Okemos, Michigan, which is where we left when I was five years old before we moved to New Hampshire. So I drove through a snowstorm. I don't know how far from Evanston to East Lansing it is, but like three to four hours, I want to say. Um, I would have thought even maybe longer. It was maybe long longer. Wow. And I was so just, just like, to clarify, a girl he'd barely dated broke up with him, and it made him forget the past 13 years of <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that, that was yeah. hitting me. The happiest the guy who loves happy. his parents, loved high school, loved his brother. Yeah. He's like, you know what? She literally set him back 13 years. Wow. Oh and I drove and I went and I saw our old house. I saw oh. our old elementary school. And so there's sweet. a bagel place in East Lansing right near Michigan State called Bagel Fragel. And I went to Bagel Fragle because we used to go there. Our mom got her master's at Michigan State. And I went to Bagel Fragle, and there was a payphone. There were no cell phones. And there was a payphone between uh, when you, the first double doors, first set of double doors, second set of double doors. And I called mom and dad. And I was beside, I was like, she, you know, it's over. It's not going to work out. In the meantime, Seth has woken up in Evanston, Illinois, because <laughs> uh, we're both at Northwestern, and sees just an empty space where the car had been, mm. and called the police because he thought the car had been stolen. <laughs> no. Well, first I called home and told my dad the car is gone, and this is harkens back to why I woke up the morning and went downstairs when Josh got in trouble, because 
everybody always assumes I'm the one who fucked up. Mm. And so my dad was like, did you leave it unlocked? Did you leave the keys in it? Mm. And it should be noted, the reason everybody thinks I'm the one who fucked up is I do shit like that all the time. So I was like, probably, I probably did those things. He's like, well, that's why it got stolen. So now you have to call the police. So I called the police and, uh, and, and then Josh, I guess because you called home, yeah, a blubbering phone call from a payphone to mom and dad, who then called you. Yes. And they were like, Josh is in <laughs> Okemos, Michigan. <laughs> He's a Fraggle Bagel. He's a Fraggle Bagel. <laughs> bagel Wait, this Fraggle, is really fun. I will say, oh, being right, very yeah. depressed and going to a place called Bagel <laughs> Fraggle is yeah. really funny. <laughs> and then I was so mad because I didn't feel like enough attention was being paid to how I had been blamed <laughs> because my dad was like, so the car isn't, wasn't stolen. And I said, you know, actually it was stolen. Josh stole it. <laughs> because otherwise he would have said, I'm taking the car. So it was stolen, actually. And uh, now, but was that a different one, Josh, than the time that we were leaving the, the day party, the, the Greek restaurant? Was that a different girl that you were so upset about then? Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, but I remember... Yeah. That was different. So another time, <laughs> so Josh and I were in the same fraternity, and we went to this fraternity event that was just, there was no girls, and it was like a, a basically like a Midwestern 90s binge drinking, and I, I wouldn't recommend it. But we'd gone to a great restaurant, and Josh, again, had gone was going through a different bad breakup. And he and I, our family is Steelers fans. My dad's from Pittsburgh. And that next weekend, we were going to see a Steelers game. And we're driving back on this bus, and Josh is basically drunk and crying. And I said, hey, look at it this way. A week from now, we're going to... I'm going to go see the Steelers in Pittsburgh. And I'll never forget. Mm. He goes, I never loved the Steelers. I love to see you with that. <laughs> uh, oh, my yeah. goodness. So, I mean, but I was a theater major, you guys. So <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. now it's all making sense. It all makes I, sense. I, I love your family. I yeah. love, <laughs> yeah, like, just the, 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 that, that, Josh, you would have driven so far. And it was a place where, when you're recalling now, you can't even refrain from telling us that that's where your mother got your, got her masters. And yeah. then you go into the you and you go into the you go into the phone booth and you just immediately call mom and dad. So and then sweet. the first thing they do is call Seth, if yeah. I understand correctly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. just like it's just I I mean it's beautiful. It's, I, it's a really lovely lovely thing to hear and and reminisce about. I'm so happy. We went to college together. The main reason isn't even for the time we spent together in college. It's that Josh and I are now part of the same college friend group. Where mm. you know, there's 12 of us that get together once a year, and Josh is. So I, you know, have this great weekend where I both see all my oldest college friends and my brother. So that is how it pays off. It was mm. a little stressful because when. I was at college when you have your younger brother and your family as close as ours. There was this expectation that I would look out for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so when Josh would have these moments, there, I always felt there was a sense from my parents of like, could you not let him drive to Okemos? And I'm like, no. <laughs> Creeped over in the dead of night. Yeah, I'm pretty... I don't quite know how to... Pretty elusive in that way. But also, I remember there was... Um, we were in the same fraternity, but I had so many of my friends pledged a different fraternity. And it felt also to me like this horrible emotional cleaving and that I would never see these people again. And I remember going to Seth's, you know, room in the, in the frat house and just like bawling, mm. and bawling my eyes out that it hadn't gone the way that I wanted it to go and that me mm. and these friends weren't going to be together and that was the end of things and then I was just at a reunion recently and it was so strange the group we were hanging out was like the first floor of that dorm was sort of the hub it wasn't a fraternity thing and those friends I am still friends with and shared a king bed with one of them because neither of us were smart enough to get the room with the double queen <laughs> um, but yeah um do you feel like that dynamic is still true today? Like it sounds like, Josh, you're quite a bit more sensitive and emotional than Seth. Is that true today? I, I, th I think I, I mean, Seth is, I'm more sensitive, but Seth is sensitive. I think mm -hmm. he just needs to sort of step off the ledge a mm -hmm. bit more. And when he does, uh, 
you know, those tears will come pretty readily. Uh, That's very true. Seth loves uh, Thanksgiving and very often will cry in the midst of a Thanksgiving toast. Aww. Aww. Um, and, best uh, holiday. Yeah. yeah. It's the best holiday. <laughs> it's Agreed. my favorite one. Agree. I've heard at least one of you refer to your dad, like today, as your best friend. And yeah. We're just talking about how much we all love your family, even though we haven't met your parents. But um, I want to know, can you point to anything that he did growing up that has led to that? Like any, I know it's probably so many things, but. Well, I will just say, so he worked really hard and he commuted to Boston, which was an hour drive each way. So he got home fairly late and would leave pretty early. But the thing I remember about dad is he never had anything else going on other than us on the weekends. Mm. There was never any sense that until we had our own things we wanted to do, did he start having a hobby even. You know, that Mm. he was never like when he picked up golf, it was the four of us would go golfing. And when he, you know, he started umpiring Little League games because we were playing Little League. And Mm. so, but it was all, there was never a sense that he had any hobbies outside being our dad. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty awesome. Yeah. Also, like when he would get home from work, that was a big event for us. And we would always, you know, he'd be in a suit or a shirt and tie and uh, he'd be like, come upstairs with me while I change. And so instantly we were, Aww. you know, sitting on the bed while he was, you know, getting into more comfortable clothes. And, uh, you know, we always had dinner together, the four of us at the table. Mm-hmm. Um, this yeah. is, uh, I, I should, so we have, <laughs> my wife uh, uh, pointed this out the first time she came to, because my parents still live in the house, Josh and I grew up in. We only ever ate dinner at the kitchen table, and it's the smallest kitchen table. Like, you couldn't fit a fifth chair there (laughs) if you tried. And she, her take on my family would be, we are deeply insular. (laughs) 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 My dad once said, which uh, will not surprise uh, uh, either of our significant others, he, uh, along his lines of, like, don't have sex with a girl because it'll matter more to her than you, he said, uh, if ideally marry an orphan. <laughs> 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 he was like, it'll because just be easier to, to not have to him. integrate two families. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, he really pushed the orphan thing hard. Ideally. <laughs> he really, it was a long, long say. running bit of his. But he, uh, so Josh gave a, a, the greatest best man toast in the history of weddings. Mm. at mine and as he says the tears do come i had four in my life the four hardest cries of my life happened within the same toast where i would compose myself (laughs) and then he would say something where i would just have like i think the word for it is like a crying jag (laughs) just like 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 i would buckle over because it, it hit me again and uh, one of my friends actually said who uh, has <laughs> she turned to her husband during Josh's speech. They had one kid and said, we have to have another kid. Aww. Aww. It's like she understood the importance of like siblings based on Josh's toast at our wedding. But Josh, the really funny theme of it was how welcoming, like how we grew up. And this is true. We grew up, we sat at that kitchen table every night. We had dinner and then we would play hearts. And it was always the same teams. Mm. And it was me and my mom against Josh and my dad. And we uh, every night we would play hearts. And Josh was saying like how the great thing about hearts is it's a four-person game and we're a four-person family. And he tells this lovely speech and he talks about uh, my wife and he talks about my wife's family and Josh is very close with them as well. So, you know, the, the joke being Mary an orphan, but, you know, we I got incredibly lucky with my in-laws. Um, mm. But then at the very end, Josh was like, and we just want you to know you're always welcome at our table unless we're playing hearts. Because that is a four-person game. <laughs> and there was, a real, there was a real, some real truth in that. Seth, are you going to have your, your writers prepare your speech for Josh's wedding, or are you going to tackle that one on your own? I, know, a lot of I try very hard to, to not let my writers punch up anything personal um, <laughs> because they're just ultimately not that good at people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're good at writing jokes about, say, the news, but if you ever left, you never want Nothing them to speak felt. from your heart because theirs are black. <laughs>
You guys have a podcast called Family Trips, and yes. um, guests come on and they share about memorable family trips, and we want to hear about your most memorable childhood family trip. I mean, it is, I think one of the reasons we started doing our podcast is that the ones we always talk about are the disasters. Mm. And that, and, and I, I think because our family was A, close, and B, had a real appreciation for humor, when things went bad, there was always something funny about it. And yeah. We'd love to hear about a disaster trip. Yeah, what? I mean, the the this the singular day that was the biggest disaster is we went to Bush Gardens in Tampa Bay, and there was a hurricane. Is it was that? a hurricane, and there were also some tornadoes about. Oh my god! Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Double whammy. And so they evacuated <laughs> the park, and you we had to run out of the park and get on this sort of tram that would take you back to where you were parked. And we all got on the tram, and then as it pulled away, we realized Josh was not on the tram. He was just <laughs> sort of standing. Like, I don't know. Like, when you, like, when it, when it, uh, it was like very felt like a, a, a black and white romance where someone is just like left on the dock. Aww, yeah. And, uh, gosh. and it was, the- and then my parents turned on each other pretty hardcore <laughs> as far as who fault that was. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then we, we finally managed to get them, and then we got in a car, and it was standstill traffic. And our dad was so mad that every time the traffic moved three inches, he would floor it and then slam on the brakes. (laughs) (laughs) It's the worst day of my life. (laughs) And yeah, we we went to a we went to a lake in Maine uh, or a pond because it was called Molasses Pond. Um, And it just there were bugs and there was a bad outhouse and our mother got stung by a uh, bit by a horse fly and her arms swelled up like her forearms were like Popeyes and my mother still contends that it was a great trip and she holds on to it and has like <laughs> speaks about it lovingly but it was it was trouble all around mm. um, to my yeah. mom's uh, eternal credit I don't think she can say it was a bad trip if both her boys were there Aww. yeah and That's she really so can't sweet. Okay. Our father threatened a uh, coffee table in a lobby in a hotel in Florida because it it had hurt him. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. He, he bumped was, into it and blamed it. He blamed the inanimate <laughs> object and swore at it and uh, yeah, balled up a fist and got real close to to yeah. smashing it to smithereens. And um, he gets really mad. He sort of curses like this. It's like not it's you, like you a, can't like a cartoon <laughs> character. Yeah, you don't hear an actual curse word but you know that was what it was yeah it's like in a christmas story when the dogs have come in and where the dad yells like does that bump us <laughs> <laughs> so it's like there's it's a collection of swears it's those um yeah those series of punctuations that imply a swear but you don't know exactly how to read them but we are we're not you know the even uh even today when we're all together you know, we like obviously uh, going out to dinner and, and we'll go to uh, sporting events tends to be uh, where we uh, congregate these days. But we all the, the highlight is always end of the night, just sitting around playing cards or, or playing a board game. And uh, it's really it's the best. Do you think um, the advent of smartphones would have shattered your family unity or <laughs> like I'm I, like, yeah, I'm wondering. I don't mean it really, but I'm just it sounds so. Your fond memories sound very fond, you know, and I'm thinking yeah. about how technology would have potentially really complicated that. It's you know? funny every now and then my mom will be like, "Oh, kids today." I mean, I never would have let a kid look at the phone at the at the kitchen table. I'm like, "Which phone? The one on the wall?" <laughs> 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 like, at least appreciate it's harder now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I would um, if a, if a phone had literally every book on it. <laughs> I think I might have <laughs> wanted to look at it. Yeah. You mentioned this this tradition with your dad where he comes home and, and you guys sit on the bed together and then he spent, you know, he devoted all his weekends to you. My impression of someone in your position as like a late night host and, and all the many things that you do and that you're so talented at is that your time would be different. Like you wouldn't have as much time available to you. So I'm wondering how you're thinking about kind of your relationship with your kids and, and what you'll be able to carry forward and what you might not. 
So weirdly, I would have also failed. thought that. But uh, yeah, no, I, I've got a bunch of. Are you gonna be a shit dad, out. or are you gonna <laughs> get it together? Well, I, so I, you know, I know this is hard to believe, but I actually have a very good schedule. I don't mm. think I could have been a good dad when I was at SNL. Mm. But late night's not terrible. And after the pandemic, we started taping earlier in the day. We tape at four. And I get home. I put my kids to bed every night. And That's awesome. Mm. The hard thing is when I want to do another thing. If I want to start, you know, working on stand-up again, mm. and then you're basically picking one weekend a month where you're going to leave. And that is the, that where the trade-off is. But ultimately, if I could just be satisfied with doing late night, it's not it's not as awful as you'd think mm-hmm. and i'm very lucky because to be to have a job in showbiz where ultimately every night's a home game and i don't work that far from where i live and so i think i think i'm doing a pretty decent job i also oh, don't uh, have any hobbies and uh, <laughs> you know, very very uh, fingers crossed that this holds very few friends <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just, I also want to sort of just come back because I don't want it to get lost in all this because our father would take a lot of uh, business trips as well. Mm. And, uh, you know, our mother was, you know, she had us for so much of the days and oh my on God, are we going to talk alone. about how great moms are? <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Get back but to the soapbox. I mean, she, she was and is the best and... Mm. Uh, and yeah, did it did it all solo and was um, oh. yeah, it was just amazing and so sweet and loving. And she uh, had been a teacher and she stopped teaching uh, when she had us. And then as soon as we were in school and um, you know had had regular length school days, she went back to teaching and did that for years. But she uh, yeah. She was she was great. I'm glad you She's said something because I was really starting to yeah. judge you. <laughs> you guys were the ones who were like, your dad. I've heard you say yeah. your dad's your best friend. You yeah, yeah. 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 well, implied in that was like, I haven't heard you say anything about your mom. Oh, you laid a trap. <laughs> oh, is this the trap podcast? Yeah. The, um, the other thing about uh, our favorite thing about our mom. Oh, not our favorite thing, but one of the great things about our mom is she was just like, and again, she's an educator. And a, a beloved educator, retired now. But she also had this real sense of mischief. If you were sick or oh, yeah. wanted to pretend like you were sick, she was always down to just oh. let you stay home. Mm. She would go to the video store. She'd rent two movies, mm. bring them home. You would just chill all day with her. Whereas... If my dad left for work, you would wait till your dad, our dad left before you'd try to be like, I think it's a, there's a tickle. Because if he, he would never buy that mm. bullshit. He'd say toast and tea. And yeah, have some toast and tea. And you're like, oh, what's the point? <laughs> never mind, I'll go to school. <laughs> like I choke down toast and tea. But it, she was, so that, I mean, so much of my childhood, I just loved those days. And I think Josh and I had a sense too of, you know, we, we almost treated them like professional sick days ourselves mm-hmm. we couldn't you we couldn't cash it in that often yeah but uh and never on the same day but it was so much fun <laughs> to stay home with her That's she would really go get sweet. a pizza yeah she oh, she, was, she was down to hang Pizza's also, terrible Seth, for a cold I know exactly. Yeah. That's how well, she knew you weren't colds. sick. She's like, let's yeah. get you some dairy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Seth in his high school transcript or something, it's like you missed something like 66 days of school, something it was crazy. No, it was bad. Really? It was a big number. It was yeah. a big wow. number. It was like just just under the number of like, <laughs> you got to come back. Buddy. True and see. <laughs> I should say in high school, I, I feel as though a lot, I teachers liked me. But they all thought I wasn't living up to my potential. Hmm. But they didn't think I was a bad kid, but they were a little disappointed at how. And I just remember this really lovely teacher who, and I was friends with her son. Her name was Mrs. Alden, and she was a math teacher. And the amount that I would just be sick on test days. (laughs) And she would just say, are you, uh, how are you feeling? I'm like, I'm feeling better. She goes, can't help but notice. It just seems to be on test days. I'm like, I know. I've also noticed it's such the weirdest thing. So we just... When did you start to see yourselves as performers? When, or when did that in- start to interest you? And when did comedy call? We used to watch um, uh, Mystery, PBS Mystery. Um, and after Mystery one night, 
Monty Python came on and we found it completely by accident. And so that was sort of our entree into sort of adult, silly comedy. And um, so I think that was hugely influential to us. And our mother had been a theater major briefly in college. Our father is very entertaining, like he can command a dinner table. Um, and yeah, then we would also, we would hang out at the foot of our parents' bed, sort of pseudo performing for them every night before they would go to bed. We sort of, I don't know <laughs> if we got tucked in or yeah, if we you sort put of in a way tucked them in. Yeah, yeah. just put them to bed. Um, because we would, you know, we would put on costumes or we would come in and we would just sort of parade around at the foot of their bed. Uh, and that was our first stage. Um, and my mom uh, laughs at everything. Growing up, my take was she just laughed at our dad all the time. <laughs> and it was really sweet. And it just, it, mm. I think there was the thought of, ah, so this is a good, good inroad with the opposite sex. <laughs> Be entertaining mm. and funny. Um, yeah, we, there were like some talent shows in our high school where Josh and I would do, you know, either SNL sketches or Monty Python sketches. And that was a really, that was a really cool thing. That was the first time being on stage for me, making peers laugh where you think, oh my God, this is the best feeling in the world. Because so much of high school is, is anybody, you want the right kind of attention, uh, and you're so afraid of the wrong kind of attention. And so to like be on stage doing comedy where you're, uh, you know, your friends and, and even people that weren't your friends were watching was so, so exhilarating. We do ask people a couple of questions about their sort of established careers. Seth, it would be great to hear your journey to SNL. Just sort of like, when did that come on your radar? How did you get into that? I mean, the journey, I mean, it was, it was so weird because I ended up working on the show that taught me everything I knew about comedy because Josh mm -hmm. and I would watch it we would stay up and watch it and we would tape it. And then when our parents woke up on Sunday morning, because they watched it when they were younger, we would fast forward and throw them, show them the sketches we thought were funny. Mm -hmm. And that again was sort of born out of the fact that I think we have the same sense of humor as our parents. So we would know the ones they wouldn't like. And those were also the ones we didn't like. And then we both, Josh and I both did, it's a very similar path. Uh, we both did the improv troupe at Northwestern. Mm -hmm. And then we both worked for this comedy theater in Amsterdam called Boom Chicago. Hmm. And then I came back from that and I was just doing this two person show with our friend Jill Benjamin in Chicago. And randomly one night I was doing this little improv festival and someone who worked in the SNL talent department was there and saw it and asked me to send in an audition tape. And this is back when you would have to find a friend with a camera, like a video camera, and they would record it on a little tape. And then you'd have to bring that little tape to like a Kinko's where oh, they put right, it on yeah. a VHS tape. Yeah. And, uh, and then I mailed it in. And I remember at the time just thinking the fact that SNL gave me their address was a perfectly good story that I would tell the rest of my life. Mm. Like, they huh. gave me their mailing address. <laughs> wow. Um, but, yeah, so it, it all, it was weird. I, I didn't quite have a plan after college, uh, but then I got lucky enough that, that things kept happening. And, uh, but it, was, it all happened very fast. I was 27 when I started at SNL, and, uh, and I've been working in the building with the same ID ever since. Wow. 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 Yeah. Did you Do people um, still believe that picture is you? <laughs> <laughs> it's I get some very like <laughs> withering looks from the uh, security guards. <laughs> did you I watch SNL but I don't remember did you act did you were you always a writer? I know you did the weekend update, but were you ever in the skits? Uh very hurtful. Um, so, <laughs> so actually, so here's the thing. So I got cast as a, as a cast member and, uh, it was not good. It was very rocky. Mm. I, I did not think I was going to actually make it. I, and I feel like I have a good, I'm not too hard on myself. I feel like I'm very, I have a, I'm good at honestly assessing where I fit in an ecosystem. And okay. I just looked around when I was there and thought, man, if I was writing for this show, I would be my eighth choice when I was uh -huh. writing a sketch. You know, I was there with Andy Samberg and Jason Sudeikis and Bill Hader and Fred Armisen and Will Forte. It's just at some point I'm like, they're yeah. really great. You know what I mean? And like, it's not, I wasn't mad at myself. I'm like, you're good. It's <laughs> just, this is a hard place to be good. You gotta be great. Yeah. And, but I also, in that time, I was doing a lot of writing. And so then when Tina Fey left, Lauren asked if I wanted to basically join the writing staff, which I had not actually officially been a member of, to sort of run things while she was on maternity leave. 
And then I parlayed that into being the head writer. And when I got Weekend Update, I then stopped, you know, trying to force mm-hmm. myself into sketches, which nobody, myself included, wanted anyway. <laughs> okay, we, but it was, it wasn't, it took until like year five where I was like, okay, they're, they're getting their money's worth with me. Seth, you've talked openly about kind of your first year, a couple years at late night being a bit rough, sort of not what people expected from you. And I, I think it's a really actually inspiring story of sticking it through something that sounds like it'd be pretty challenging and, and being flexible about it. And I'm just curious, I don't know if you want to like recap that a little bit for people who don't know, but also what was that time like for you emotionally? Like it, that just sounds like something that would be so grueling. And how did you get through it? It was, it was, I was really rough and it was a time where I was then transitioning into having a family. Hmm. So even though SNL was a, a roller coaster, at least I had the room to be incredibly selfish about my uh, stress and my anxiety. And now all of a sudden I'm married and we're going to start a family. And I got the show and it was very exciting, but I just, the mistake I made was aiming for competence. I just wanted to show I could do a talk show and didn't put enough focus into doing the talk show I wanted to do. I don't know if that makes sense, but I thought, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to show everybody I can do a monologue just like anybody else who has a talk show. And then ultimately, if you aim for things other people are doing better than you, you end up in the same situation I was at SNL, which is there's a lot of people who are great. And, you know, when you have a lot of great, you don't need a good necessarily. Mm. And so it still rubs me to this day. But when I started the show, Lauren Michael said it will take you 18 months to figure it out. And I at the time I was riding high. I was a head writer at SNL. And I was like, it's not going to take me 18 months. It was six months tops, mm. probably four. <laughs> and then it was fully 18 months in where I was like, I'm going to not do a monologue. I'm going to start behind a desk. I'm going to get back to my weekend update roots. And when I realized it was exactly 18 months, I was mm. so mad. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that son of a gun did it again. <laughs> but yeah, now it's, I think, uh, yeah, 10 years in February, which right, is congratulations. Uh, crazy. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Josh, will you tell us about your path to Mad TV, what that experience was like for you? Yeah, I mean, it was very similar to Seth. I I came out of uh, Boom Chicago in Amsterdam, and I met Ike Barinholtz over there, um, a very funny actor and great writer. And he and I moved to, he had moved back to L.A. uh, a year before me, and then I moved here, and we uh, put up a two-person show. Um, That was pretty good. I think it was really funny. Um, Mm -hmm. And we knew, we were friendly with... um, Nicole Sullivan, who was sort of not, I don't think she was an original uh, Mad TV member, but like year two or year three, and she uh, brought the casting director and said, you have to see this show. And so from that show, Ike and I both got sort of in-person auditions at Mad TV and then were hired sort of together as a team. Um, And then I only did a couple years there, but then managed to parlay that into the last season of that 70s show, which Mm -hmm. is somewhat... um, yeah, there are people that I'll run into and they'll be like, I hate you. You stole Eric's girlfriend. And I'm like, I, it's, that's no, it's, his name is Topher. He went to go do Spider-Man 2. I didn't steal anybody's anything. Like, I, um, and I should note, I am one of those people. <laughs> yeah, I just he, feel like Seth Eric. Seth wears his Team Eric shirt all the time, which is very I was Team Eric before me. you got that part. That's not something I started when. Um, and yeah, so sort of that's my path. And then just since then, I've sort of been cobbling it together with uh, gigs here and there. And uh, if I said I wasn't jealous of the consistency and longevity of Seth's career, I would be lying. But um, but I'm not alone out here sort of trying to find the next thing. And yeah. now and he's, uh, he's always been, all, I have to say, he's always been incredibly supportive. He's um, the best, best brother in the world. And now, now I got a podcast, so at yeah. least there's that. If nothing and I else. will say, I mean, I we were, you know, uh, we were chatting over on that podcast with you guys, and you, I think you probably are intensely closer for having done a podcast, mm-hmm. um, basically since it seems like you were essentially strangers <laughs> before I started. <laughs> yeah. And finally learned but, Sophie's name. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> but Josh step. and I were talking recently, and this is, uh, this is authentic. You know, we are so close. Obviously, you can tell, you know, we have spent our whole lives being incredibly close, but we've also been on the opposite coast for almost two decades. Mm. And having a podcast has been the most 
I, the, the part I did not see coming was how nice it is that we're spending an hour together every week. It's been That's so sweet. I think sometimes men, male friends, like don't talk well. Mm-hmm. You know, Josh and I will chat through a week, but like it's actually been really special to have that time. Yeah, built in really time. Sweet. Yeah. Now, yeah. Sophie, did you notice that they said just one hour a week? <laughs> was, was, I was literally going to say, I think Penn didn't anticipate that he would be spending so much time with us. <laughs> I think he might have made a different decision. <laughs> what are we doing wrong? <laughs> what is going on? Josh, I did want to ask you just a follow up um, sure. on that 70s show because I do think that's a, that's a tough, I would imagine, a tough position to be in to come take over. Like, he was sort of the lead. I know that it was an ensemble show, but in a way, he was kind of the lead of the show. Um, just what was that like to step in on like the last season of an established show? What was that like for you on set? What was that like? It was it was great. Um, mm. Everyone was so nice. Everyone was so welcoming. It also it wasn't like I was stepping into like a new lead position. Like I was a new side character. Mm. Um, and um, they had that show down to a science in the last mm. year. Like they would they would camera block it with uh, stand-ins. So I want to say Monday. Everything would get camera blocked. Um, so Tuesday you'd go in and you would know in this scene you're going to start on the couch, you're going to move to the washing machine, and you could change things wow. up. But we probably worked 24-hour work weeks. Wow. Um, and we would tape on Friday night, and it was an event. Like, it was such a popular show. Mm. Um, you know, everyone I was working with was a millionaire multi-times over, and I feel like... Uh, was happy about that and yeah. where, where everyone was comfortable <laughs> and nice and um, you know, Ashton Kutcher's dressing room had been turned into a poker room. It was a time oh, wow. in the world when everything was poker and mm-hmm. poker was so popular and you would you know, you'd go up after you were done for a show and maybe there'd be a couple more scenes and like a young rumor Willis would be playing poker with like whoever was there <laughs> hanging out and it was just it was wow. really, yeah, it was an event and yeah. uh, it was great to be a part of. And also coming off of Mad TV that had an audience that felt very often like it was sort of cycled through and it's like, hey, do you want to see a TV show? Versus that 70s show, people would come dressed up, people mm. would propose, uh, wow. people like wow. would get a group of their friends together and uh, after the show, you know, we would sign autographs and it was very... Uh, tactile with the audience and they really loved it and you could really feel that in the room. I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but the last scene of that 70s show uh, was New Year's Eve 1979. I was not in that episode or I wasn't in that scene and they sort of apologized to me. I was like, it's fine. It's, it, I'm not too precious about this. And it was a very hard scene for the cast to get through because they had done this show for so long and it's emotional when you get to the end of a show. And um, so we were trying to shoot the scene. People were crying. Uh, People were stumbling over lines. We kept having to reset. We kept having to have makeup come out. And we were finally getting it. They had sort of hit a stride and it was like, this is the shot, this is the take. And a phone rang. And uh, (laughs) Ashton Kutcher was there and Demi Moore was there and it was Demi Moore and she took the call. (laughs) And the director was like, what? She like, her phone rang and she was like, yeah, hello. Um, And it was like, and we had to do it again. And it was such a, it was amazing. It was really amazing. I mean, no disrespect to me, but it was was a pretty. But you can't, they didn't have phones in 1979, so you got to cut it out. uh, Yeah, (laughs) it was a pretty high level Hollywood uh, flex. To yeah. take that call yeah. in that situation. <laughs> David and I were driving through Burbank the other day and I was seeing all these studios and I was thinking about the, all the scenes and shots that are outside of studios. And then I was just thinking someone has to location scout. And that in itself sounds like I would, if I had to location scout for a movie, I, I'd quit. I'd be like, <laughs> it's too exhausting already. And that's one, like one millionth of what it takes to make a show or let alone a film. It sounds so complicated. I'm I'm shocked that anything ever gets made. Just when you were describing like the blocking of that 70s show, I'm like, yeah, that sounds nice. That, that sounds It was really so nice. nice. And also it, it was such a, 
It was such an event, and it like people loved it so much that I still like I'll go to that CBS Radford lot, and security guards will still remember me, and they're like, "Oh Aww. man, yeah, it's not it's not like it used to be because it was fun. It brought something fun to a lot." Yeah. Uh, and yeah, people were people were psyched for it. It was yeah, it was a lot of fun. I was uh, um, grateful to have had that opportunity and probably wish I was better in the show, but I'm not going to watch it again to, to, to see if uh, what the people say about me is, is real. Like maybe I didn't know what to do with my arms. I didn't know what to do with my arms. That's one of the reasons I had to start my show at the desk. I was so bad doing a monologue. I always, somebody said, it always looks like you're trying to land a plane. <laughs> <laughs> we always ask if you could go back to your 12-year-old self, what would you say or do? And then I think maybe I also want to hear what do either one of you recall about the other at that age? Mm -hmm. And is there something that you would have said to the other one as well at that age? I, when we knew we were doing this, I always come back to this haunting memory of the first time I feel like I got invited to a party. And again, because I was so close with my parents, I was trying to figure out what to wear and I feel like I it was the wrong time to involve my parents because <laughs> my dad felt like very strongly that I should wear like nice pants and a, yeah. sw and a sweater <laughs> and then it was just everybody was dressed the way like I it was like I thought it was like semi formal and it was mm. just in a, a friend's basement and I so I think one thing I wouldn't want to say much to my 12 year old sense because I'm always worried that like he did get me here. Yeah. But I would say don't overthink it. I wish you could just tell kids, don't overthink it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You're, ultimately, your first instinct is probably your best instinct. And I think that kids, so much of the thinking I did was about how other people were going to perceive me instead of how I perceived myself. So that mm -hmm. was the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, and I still to this day, sort of have this hang up but I think I would say don't it doesn't have to be perfect and like learn almost fail intentionally and learn to love it I feel mm. like I'm so afraid of something not working mm. and sort of I I don't ship the work a lot of times I don't I don't put things out there because I hold on to them because I want them to be better and I feel like now I'll see I'll see people that like just put put stupid things on YouTube and it's like you watch them and it's like this is terrible that's terrible that's terrible that's awful and then you're like yeah but now they're like they've got this show and it's good and it's they weren't afraid to put something out that the world could look at and critique and you know, yeah, it wasn't good because you were just learning uh, at that time. I'm so impressed with, nothing impresses me more than a stand-up that delivers the joke that fails and no one seems to enjoy it more than the stand-up. Mm. Yeah. Um, whereas that just would feel awful to me and I would love to sort of, I'd love to have more experience, experience with, with failing and not caring yeah. um, or learning mm. from it. I get not caring is not the right thing. It's just yeah. learning from it and not taking it personally. I do say to any young, when young people ask me about getting into comedy, and I think it's probably true of everything, which is it's failure is easy when you're younger. You think it's harder because you're so worried about your peer group. But the longer you wait to try something, the harder yeah. it gets to take that first step. And so, so true. I, I always am like, you know, you want to be a comedian? Go on stage wherever, go like do a high school talent night, do a college, because you'll bomb and you'll learn more from bombing than you ever will from watching people succeed. Watching mm. someone, someone's finished product is not an education. Yeah, uh, that's a great point. What would you say to each other if you could? Uh, I mean, I... I mean, yeah. I would. I mean, if I could go back in time, I'd tell Josh, like, don't get the perm. 
<laughs> Did you get a perm? Josh? It wasn't. It wasn't a perm. It was a vavoom from L'Oreal. <laughs> what, is what is that? They had a poster. Oh, what is it? Look. It's a perm. <laughs> All right. There's a video element to this show, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Just look at my hair and look at Seth's show, hair and oh, see no. if the perm. See if the Wait, perm you think that yours, I had a long you time You think ago. your hair looks better than mine now because you got it vavoomed? I think that it, it gave me a little more bounce. And I'm still well, then, uh, then I hope them. if you could go back in time, you would tell me to get the vavoom. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's fair enough. If you could come back to me at 12 with that hair and be like, get the vavoom, I would do it in a heartbeat. You would heartbeat. have done it. I'm yeah. so jealous. It's yeah, the you best. Do have great it's hair. Hair. We used to both have yeah. great hair. <laughs> we used to, there's pictures of us where I'm like, where? When did it all come off? When did the wheels come off? <laughs> well, yeah, I think it's when when you decided not to go with me to the hair cutters at Merrimack and Merrimack yeah. and get this get that treatment. Or maybe I just have the hair of a man with three children. Yeah. <laughs> could be, could maybe be. when you delivered a baby in the lobby. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that yeah. You should have seen, oh my God, the, the day before lobby baby, full yeah. head. <laughs> <laughs> there was no gap between my uh, top of my eyebrow, bottom of my hair. <laughs> oh, thank you guys so much for coming yeah, thank on. Thank you. What a delight. Oh, what a delight this to spend great. the afternoon with you guys. You can listen to Family Trips wherever you get your podcasts, and you can follow Seth at Seth Myers and Josh at Josh D. Myers. David, you can hear, and are you being recorded too? Uh, yes, and yes. You're about to be a father. How are you feeling? <laughs> I feel uh, extremely excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, get me off this recording device. He, I think now you know why he recused himself. Yeah. <laughs> right. If that's the best he could do, excited. I see why he wanted him off the podcast. <laughs> I am David is, like, David over is such a sweet the moon. <laughs> He's such a sweet, personable guy. It's funny that the that um that the mic changes him like that. Yeah. <laughs> the mic, the camera. He completely. I tried to film. Uh, us finding out the sex of the baby and he just because I wanted to have that as a memory like us finding out if it was a girl or boy and multiple times we I had to stop recording because he was like I I can't I don't feel like I could be myself <laughs> this moment. yeah I do like I do like his self-awareness to know that that was a very special moment yeah, yeah. and it's better to be authentic yeah, than you know, get a bad than David me. on tape yeah it's true <laughs> yeah <laughs> whereas I'm like this is content yeah. content <laughs> baby equals content I, I, I mean is it like, crazy to cast a different David for just the on <laughs> stuff? 